After watching this lecture, you should be able to describe fatty acid oxidation or beta oxidation, starting with the adipocyte and following the fatty acid release from triglyceride stores and their delivery to the liver for fatty acid oxidation in the hepatic mitochondria. You should also be able to list the rate limiting step of fatty acid oxidation and describe how it's regulated as well. So let's start with the location in the body and and a very important location where fatty acid oxidation occurs is the liver. And it also occurs in the heart as well as skeletal muscle and other selected areas in the body. I just want to point out for the heart, it turns out that the majority of ATP generation for the beating heart um, is from fatty acid oxidation actually, not glycolysis. So it does play an important role in, in, my, in cardiac myocyte metabolism as well as metabolism in the liver and skeletal muscle. Now if we recall that the fatty acid structure is this hydrocarbon tail with this carboxyl end, we can see here that the labeling of the carbons, carbon number one is right here, okay, this carbonyl carbon, and then we have the alpha carbon, which is carbon two, and the beta carbon, which is carbon three. And the final carbon in the hydrocarbon chain is the omega carbon. And the reason why we're wanting to review this is that uh, a lot of the business of fatty acid oxidation is occurring with the beta carbon, which is why this is often referred to as beta oxidation. Now the general steps of fatty acid oxidation, pretty simple, there's only four steps. The net result is every time we go through a round of beta oxidation, we are going to peel off a acetyl-CoA molecule. Now remember, acetyl-CoA is two carbons. So every time we do a round of fatty acid oxidation, we reduce the fatty acid, fatty acid chain by two carbons, all right? And we keep repeating the cycle until the very final step, a very final cycle, um, when, we, when we hydrolyze acetyl-CoA, imagine we, had, we have a four carbon fragment, we end up with two acetyl-CoAs, okay? So, for example, if we had a 16 carbon palmitate, it would take seven rounds of beta oxidation because that final round generates two acetyl-CoA molecules. Now, if we look at the four steps, we can see that um, we start off with a oxidation of the beta carbon and that oxidation process generates an FADH2 molecule. We now generate a double bond, we hydrate the double bond, we do another oxidation generating an NADH and then our final thiolytic cleavage releasing an acetyl-CoA molecule. And that's just the, the general idea about what you're doing with the fatty acid oxidation reactions. Now we're also going to talk about regulation and we're going to discuss that the primary mode of regulation of fatty acid oxidation actually is the entry of the fatty acids into the mitochondria where all of these uh, oxidative uh, enzymes are located. We'll discuss that at the very end. But before we go into the details, um, let's take a look at the big picture where this falls into everything. And we can see here that if we're thinking about the liver, which we always do, we can see that um, fatty acid oxidation is right over here on the right side with all of the other reactions that are also occurring during the fasting state. So remember, when you're fasting, you got lots of glucagon. Glucagon is turning on gluconeogenesis, glycogen breakdown. We also have fatty acid oxidation revved up as well as ketogenesis. And the fatty acid oxidation in the liver, one important role is to generate a lot of ATP to run gluconeogenesis. Remember, it takes six, about six ATP to take two pyruvate to a glucose molecule. So a lot of ATP is gonna come from fatty acid oxidation. All right, now at the same time, we have all these reactions turned on on the right during the fasting state. We're gonna have all the opposing reactions turned off. So glycolysis, glycogenesis, fatty acid biosynthesis and pentose phosphate shunt. Triglyceride synthesis is a little tricky because as we learned in a, in a previous video on triglyceride synthesis that in the liver, its rate of synthesis depends on fatty acid flux. So if we have a lot of fatty acids entering the liver during fasting, we actually might be making some triglycerides and shipping them back out as well. But in this general schematic, uh, 
we got triglycerides over here on the left. Now, when we're in the well-fed state, we get the exact opposite. We have lots of insulin, we're toning down all the reactions on the right, and we're turning on in the liver all the reactions on the left, glycolysis, glycogen synthesis, fatty acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, and pentose phosphate shunt. Okay, so that's the big picture. Remember, fatty acid oxidation is turned on in the fasting state. Now, if we go and take a look at another diagram that we've seen before, remember, a good way to think about all this is glucose moving in and out of the liver. So, again, during the fasting state, we have glucose leaving the liver because we're running gluconeogenesis and where glucose in the plasma is low, we're trying to resupply the plasma glucose and stabilize it, and we're breaking down glycogen, we're, we're converting pyruvate, and converging down to glucose so it can go and leave the cell down at its concentration gradient. Now at the same time we have fatty acids entering the liver cell, going through the oxidative process, getting uh, acetyl-CoA molecules and ultimately generating ATP. That's what this ATP here is for, is to show that oxidation of fatty acids generates ATP to run gluconeogenesis. And we also have the acetyl-CoA going into ketones which then it gets shipped back out to also um, provide non-insulin dependent tissues like the brain an alternate fuel source. Now at the same time we have during the fasting state all these processes turned on again we would have all the opposing reactions turned off and if we're in the well-fed state all right glucose is entering the liver we're making glycogen, we're, gly we're having glycolysis occur, we're making fatty acids and cholesterol and triglycerides and we're sending out as VLDL okay so um, this is a nice way to think about how these reactions are going to be occurring and it really boils down to glucose going in and out of the liver cells is a major way to think about it. Now if we go and review um, fatty acid synthesis, okay, remember this is the opposite of oxidation, right? So glucose goes into the cell, we're making glycogen, we're having pyruvate go into the mitochondria, we're making acetyl-CoA which is the precursor to fatty acids. We, we go to citrate, citrate comes out, we get our acetyl-CoA in the cytosol, we make malonyl-CoA through the acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme, and then we have a complicated fatty acid synthase molecule um, enzyme, multifunctional enzyme that makes palmitoyl-CoA. The, the reason why I want to review this is because you can see that fatty acid synthesis is occurring in the cytosol, okay? And this malonyl-CoA molecule which is the product of the rate-limiting step of fatty acid synthesis, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, has a very important role, actually, in regulating fatty acid oxidation. So we're going to need to think about how this works because this malonyl-CoA that we're making during fatty acid synthesis is going to help, under these conditions, turn off the entry of fatty acids into the mitochondria, which is what we'd want. We don't want to be making fatty acids and then have them go into the mitochondria where oxidation occurs. And on the flip side, if we have acetyl-CoA carboxylase turned off, which we would in the fasting state, malonyl-CoA would go down and then that would cause the fatty acids that are coming in from the adipocyte to enter the mitochondria and be oxidized. So the, the compartmentalization of fatty acid synthesis and oxidation is very important because it segregates the two reactions so you're not going to have a futile cycle. All right. So let's take a look at uh, fatty acid oxidation or beta oxidation. And we start with the adipocyte. So remember the adipocyte has a lot of triglyceride stores that occurred during the well-fed state. And now we're going to have lipolysis occur and we're going to release those fatty acids. And the critical enzyme in the adipocyte that does that is an enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase, HSL. And you can see here that when PKA phosphorylates HSL, it's turned on, allowing you to release the fatty acids into the blood. Okay, and of course, um, adipocytes have glucagon receptors, and during the fasting state, 
those glucagon receptors, which are coupled to GS, are going to be activated, and we're going to help mobilize our fatty acids. Now, what's not shown here, which is also going to be occurring, is, a, is the glycerol is going to be released as well. Remember, triglycerides have a glycerol backbone, and that glycerol can go into the blood and get taken up by the, by the, by the hepatocyte and be also used for gluconeogenesis and some other things. We're going to leave that out of the discussion. We're just going to focus on the fatty acids here. Now, the fatty acids, when they're in the blood, they can bind to albumin. They're ultimately going to be picked up by the liver. And then when they're taken up by the liver, we add a CoA to it, making a fatty acyl-CoA. And it turns out that this fatty acyl-CoA can't traverse the mitochondrial membrane. And in fact, we need to have a shuttle mechanism to get it across. And that's where this carnitine shuttle is critical. Carnitine's a protein that is going to be... Um, um, combined with the fatty acyl CoA in a reaction um, done by carnitine acyl transferase 1, or uh, you also might see it referred to as carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, or CPT. They're this the same enzyme, just a, a different abbreviation. And this CAT1 is going to um, link this carnitine to this fatty acyl molecule and then transport it into the mitochondrial matrix to a shuttling protein and then dump off the carnitine and now there's my fatty acyl-CoA in the mitochondria, okay? So the way we get the fatty acid in is through this carnitine acyl transferase 1, okay? Now, once the fatty acyl-CoA is in the mitochondrial matrix, in this case this is the liver, there's our four steps. An oxidation, producing an FADH2, a hydration, another oxidation, and then ultimately a cleavage releasing acetyl-CoA, all right? And now I've shortened my fatty acid by two carbons. Now what happens to that acetyl-CoA? Well, one thing it can do is it can enter the TCA cycle, okay? And when we go have our TCA cycle, we make NADH, we make some FADH2, we even make a GTP. And all of these electron carriers that we're going to make, they're going to go into the electron transport chain and generate ATP. Now, why do we want ATP during the fasting state in the liver? Well, we want it to run gluconeogenesis. Now, another place this acetyl-CoA can go, which is not shown here, and we will show it in another video on ketones, is that this acetyl-CoA can be converted to ketone bodies, which then can leave, go into the blood, and be taken up by cells like the brain or, or other places that are insulin independent, okay, um, that, that rely on, on secondary fuel sources. So, going back to our picture, the fat cell is feeding the liver. It's feeding the liver fatty acids. They're going to be oxidized, and it's going to make a lot of acetyl-CoA, which we need for ATP to run gluconeogenesis, and provide the substrate to make ketones, which can go off to places like the brain who desperately need another energy source. All right? So that's how that would work. All right? Now... Um, at the same time, if you recall, um, if you recall, the fat cell, the opposite of releasing triglycerides, is taking up triglycerides in the form of fatty acids through uh, triglyceride carriers. Now, remember this lipoprotein lipase enzyme, which was anchored to the capillary endothelium uh, places like the adipocyte. This enzyme, this enzyme takes up fatty acids and stores triglycerides. So what we're doing actually is we're releasing the fatty acids into the blood and while that process is turned on, this LPL enzyme actually is turned off. And that makes sense because if you go back and look at the triglyceride synthesis and metabolism video, this LPL enzyme is induced by insulin. So if we're in the fasting state and we're breaking down triglycerides and releasing fatty acids, this LPL enzyme isn't going to be around very much to, to be promoting fat storage. Okay, So LPL and HSL are regulated in exact opposite ways, and they're really located differently. LPL is in the capillary endothelium, and HSL is actually in the adipocyte. Okay, So if we go back to um, where we started... We talked about, we talked about um, the location of fatty acid oxidation with the emphasis on the liver. We discussed the basic structure and how all the business is at the beta carbon.
the general steps, two oxidation steps, generating electron carriers that ultimately generate ATP, and of course acetyl-CoA, which makes more ATP by entering the TCA cycle and um, making ketone bodies as well. Now, the regulation, like we said, is really with this CAT1 enzyme. So it turns out that the entry of the fatty acid into the mitochondria is really what, what is the rate limiting step for fatty acid oxidation. And that's regulated by malonyl-CoA, which is the product of acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So if you recall from the fatty acid biosynthesis lecture, when glucagon's present and you're making lots of pKa and you're phosphorylating acetyl-CoA carboxylase, you turn off the enzyme, you make less malonyl-CoA, and because malonyl-CoA goes down, it's an inhibitor of CAT1, so CAT1 actually goes up. On the other hand, in the well-fed state, when glucagon is low, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is turned on, you have lots of malonyl-CoA, CAT1 is turned off. So if you think about how that would work, okay, during the period of fasting, we have less malonyl-CoA in the cytosol, which means this CAT1 enzyme is going is to be very active, okay, because you've turned off acetyl-CoA carboxylase. This wouldn't be happening during the well-fed state. During the well-fed state, all right, you have lots of malonyl-CoA, and as a result, it would be inhibiting CAT1, and you wouldn't have any of this um, synthesized fatty acid going into the mitochondria to be oxidized. And that makes sense because if you go all this trouble to make a fatty acid, you wouldn't want it to go immediately back into the mitochondria and get oxidized again um, and, and, and just waste all the energy that, that it took to make the fatty acid. Remember, these fatty acids that you're making in the hepatocyte, we're not making them here in the liver to get into the mitochondria to be oxidized. We're making them so they can ultimately be made into a triglyceride, be packaged with cholesterol and some apoproteins, and sent out as VLDL. Okay, so it can ultimately go and be stored as triglyceride in places like adipose cells. So if we go and wrap, wrap this video up, we see that we have an important consideration of location, structure, general steps, and regu important regulation by, by the interplay between fatty acid biosynthesis and oxidation. And that concludes this video on fatty acid oxidation.